And now it's time to take a look at the Nexus 1000V. We'll be spending a good amount of time on that. And then we will take a look at VMFX and then also AdapterFX. So first of all, the Nexus 1000V. This is just another modular Cisco chassis switch. The only difference is there is no cat. What do I mean by this? Well, uh, you know, this is more commonly used in the wireless world, but Albert Einstein was once asked to describe radio, and he said, uh, you see, wire telegraph is this kind of very, very long cat. You pull his tail in New York, and his head is meowing in Los Angeles. And radio operates the same way. You send signals here, and they receive them there. The only difference is there's no cat. So anyway, I just use this to ex explain that it's the same thing as a modular Cisco Nexus switch. It's just like a 7K. It's just there's no hardware. So what does this mean? Well, this creates a distributed virtual switch, or also referred to as a virtual distributed switch, or VDS, in VMware. And actually now it is supported on Hyper-V and uh, will be supported on other hypervisor platforms as well. But this is made up of a virtual supervisor module, or always a pair, so modules. And of course, those control, uh, or they take care of the control and management plane. And then virtual Ethernet modules, or VEMs, and these uh, refer to the data plane. Now, virtual supervisor modules are either hardware or software. We'll take a look at uh, in diagrams and talk about what the different options are for this. The VEMs, the virtual Ethernet modules, these, is that, these are actually software that gets installed on your hypervisor itself. So, for instance, it's a VIB file that gets installed in VMware, ESXi, or ESX. This can also include other modules called VSBs, or Virtual um, Service Blades. And these can be things such as VSG, Virtual Security Gateway, uh, the ASA 1000V, VWAS, and these use something called VPATH 2.0 for interception and control of packets. And there's also something uh, soon to be released, was announced at Cisco Live this past year, called uh, the Cloud Services Router, or CSR. So this basically is running on the same, or utilizing the same features, functionalities, and architecture of uh, the Nexus 1000V, although instead of for a switch, it's for, whoops, it's for a, obviously a router platform. Each server in the data center is represented as basically a line card in the Cisco Nexus 1000V, and it can be managed as if it were a line card in a physical Cisco switch. Now we're gonna take a look at some diagrams as soon as we get done with these slides, and this should begin to coalesce and make a lot more sense when you see these in diagrams. Taking a look at the Cisco Nexus 1000V and how it pertains to or needs or utilizes UCS, well, first of all, the UCS is compatible with Nexus 1000V, despite what some people have said. And that is to say that they work perfectly well together, uh, but one doesn't really need to know of the other necessarily. So the UCS doesn't really need to know about the Nexus 1000V, and the Nexus 1000V doesn't necessarily need to know that it's running on top of a UCS blade series, uh, as long as we take note as the administrators and don't misprovision it. So, uh, for instance, Nexus 1000V is compatible with something called VPCHM, or Virtual Port Channel Host Mode, as long as we're using Mac pinning. If we're using LACP, that would not work on a B-series chassis, because we cannot pin traffic uh, or aggregate traffic together across both Fabric Interconnects, Fabric Interconnect A, and Fabric Interconnect B. We can load balance traffic and say, hey, if the certain, you know, let's say we have 10 virtual machines on 10 VETH ports on the N1000V, and we say all the even number of VMs are gonna go out Fabric Interconnect A, and all the odd VMs are gonna go out Fabric Interconnect B. 
That's perfectly supported, and that's essentially what MAC pinning does. It pins based on the source MAC address. Now, N1KV or Nexus 1000V is not compatible with using allocating uh, dynamic VNICs when you're creating your service profiles. Dynamic VNICs create VMFX, sometimes referred to as hardware VN tag. VMFX and N1KV are mutually exclusive from one another. So really, both the VMFX and the Nexus 1000V create, uh, they both create distributed virtual switches in VMware or whatever hypervisor. But they obviously cannot both create a distributed virtual switch at the same time on the same ESXi host. It doesn't make any sense. You can't be, I mean, I suppose you could be, but it doesn't make any sense to be running multiple distributed virtual switches. Not to mention that the, uh, the VIB files that you'll see we install, those are actually different, uh, slightly different from each other. It looks the same, so just to confuse you, Cisco used the same or at least similar looking VEM files uh, to implement this. Not really, they didn't do it to confuse you. They did it because the virtual ethernet module that goes on the ESXi host, this is what creates the distributed virtual switch. The difference between VMFX and, one, and the Nexus 1000V is the control and management plane. So with the Nexus 1000V, we have virtual supervisor modules or VSMs, and those can be virtual machines, they can be running on hardware, but that's using the VSMs. With VMFX, uh, UCS Manager, really the fabric interconnect itself, that is the control plane. Okay, so VETH ports are created there on the fabric interconnects. And we're gonna install both of these from scratch, and we'll take a look at both of them uh, independent of one another. So we'll create two ESXi hosts on Blade 1 and 2 for our Nexus 1000V. And then we'll go back and we'll power those down later and we'll power up a new blade with a new ESXi host install just for VMFX. Now, why are there multiple options? Well, one of the original reasons was because Nexus 1000V, while it's currently free in what they call their freemium, uh, <laughs> interesting marketing term, uh, their freemium packaging, which basically means that you get all the base features of the Nexus 1000V and the virtual supervisor module and the virtual ethernet modules for free. If you want advanced features such as DHCP snooping, dynamic ARP inspection, uh, IP source guard, all three of those are the three amigos, they always go together. And then things like SGTs or Skaggles, uh, security group tags, security group ACLs uh, with the new uh, you know, bring your own device uh, type way of uh, tagging and marking and, and controlling traffic in your network, then uh, you have to pay an additional premium. I think it's $6.95 per CPU socket. But originally, the Nexus 1000V uh, cost just for the base install. It, it didn't used to be free. And so one of the ways that you could have insight from your UCS manager blade server or blade series and cluster into the VMs was to be able to use VMFX, okay? And so this would allow the Fabric Interconnects to provision port profiles and port groups for consumption by your ESXi VMware, you know, cluster and VMs. So this is the reason that there are two separate types of distributed virtual switches, but just keep in mind they are mutually exclusive. And I'll unpack this a lot more coming up in just a bit. So VPath, the VPath protocol is always running in the virtual ethernet module. And this directs traffic, you're gonna see in various Cisco documentation, uh, it either referred to as a VSN or a VSB. A VSN is a virtual service node, a VSB is a virtual service blade, okay? Uh, but anyhow, this directs traffic to, assuming that we have virtual service nodes or blades, uh, aside from just our virtual supervisor module, this directs traffic to those blades, such as the VSG, the virtual services gate, oh, sorry, virtual security gateway, 
or even the ASA 1000V. And it applies security or optimization policies once it gets to that services node. And then the traffic is sent back to the virtual ethernet module along with the ability to now fast switch or kind of Ceph switch the traffic directly in the VEM. So basically it takes a look at the first few and by few I mean as many packets as are necessary to denote what the flow, you know, basically to identify the flow of traffic. And once it gets the flow of traffic, the virtual security gateway or the ASA 1000 V or possibly even a combination of both or the VWAS, uh, all of those either security or optimization nodes uh, then tag the traffic and then send that traffic back to the VEM, the actual virtual ethernet module running in ESXi and tell it, hey, for all future traffic for this flow, this is where it's allowed to go. These are the other VM guests it's allowed to talk to. And this actually becomes really extremely important as we see all of our server computing platforms being virtualized in the data center. And we have a lot more east to west traffic. And by that I mean the traffic is not leaving. Uh, it's not necessarily coming in from the outside world or leaving to go out, you know, through the fabric interconnects to the upstream switches. In other words, we're not passing through physical hardware anymore. Sometimes we are, certainly, but not all the time. And a lot of the traffic these days is just east to west. So it's just going between virtual machines, whether on a different, uh, you know, different ESXi host, but still staying on a same fabric interconnect where we don't really have that granular of policy control or anything like that. We can't do ACLs yet. Um, or things of that nature. But we need to be able to apply and and do very granular you know network analysis um, optimization uh, different you know and these even could be uh, well anyway I'll, I'll save that for later uh, but but you know create security groups don't allow certain servers to talk to each other allow certain servers in a group to talk to each other we need these security and sometimes optimization techniques but we have all this east to west traffic. And, and I'll show this a lot more in the diagram. So this is really what the VPATH protocol allows for. Okay, so as I mentioned, only new traffic flows has to be first sent to the VSN or VSB, and then subsequent flows are forwarded directly on the ESXi host itself. Now, when we go to do the installation for the Nexus 1000V, the virtual supervisor module is going to install something called opaque data in the VMware vCenter for its distributed virtual switch. This is done using something called an SVS connection or server virtualization switch. VSMs and VEMs, they should all be the same version. It's important that they are. The only time when they would be out of version with each other is when you're doing an upgrade and there's obviously a very planned uh, and specific upgrade path on cisco.com for any given from any version to any version. The, your control and your management networks should probably goes without saying be quite low latency. Uh, but this is actually more critical than bandwidth itself. So vCenter downloads this information into ESXi for the VEMs to use whenever the host would be added to the Nexus 1000V distributed virtual switch. Now all VEM modules or virtual ethernet modules, all of their heartbeats should increase at roughly the same rate. And you can use the com command uh, show module VEM counters, which are the heartbeats, to see if they are increasing at the same rate. This will tell you if they're uh, being connected and, and staying connected. Now a VEM module can miss, I don't think I actually have this on here, uh, but a VEM module can miss, or I should really say a virtual supervisor module, a VSM can miss up to six heartbeats from a VEM before considering it offline. So uh, no more than six seconds can, can uh, elapse from the time, because a heartbeat is sent every one second. So uh, no more than six seconds can elapse without it thinking that the Ethernet module 
or blade got dynamically removed from the virtual chassis. And we're always, it's always a good idea or good practice to hard code the VEM to the module number before you add the ESXi host to Nexus 1000V. Basically, the Nexus 1000V supervisor modules have a command called module. You know, VSM, uh, your, your primary and secondary soups are always going to be module one and two, period, always. Then I'll have up to 64 additional VEM modules per chassis, per virtual chassis. So that means I can have up to 64 ESXi hosts per distributed virtual switch or per Nexus 1000V, you know, virtual switch. And the modules, the ESXi hosts, are identified to the supervisor modules by their UUID. So what I can do is before I ever even bring them online, I can get the UUID of the ESXi host uh, and in fact, I have this uh, right here. Get the UUID from the ESXi host by going out to the shell, SSH or direct shell, and saying ESXCFG-info space dash U. And then just make sure that you use lowercase case letters when you're copying. So this actually will return uppercase letters. Make sure you convert those to lowercase. And then you will paste that UUID under the module command in the VSM before you bring that VEM online, and then that VEM will get added in the particular order that you wish. You can also just do them dynamically, uh, and, and it will allow you to populate them dynamically, but best practice is to hard code it. Now in the virtual ethernet module, the VEM, we're not so much going to be provisioning ports directly as much as we will be provisioning port profiles. And then those port profiles will be attached to the ports. And anytime we make a change it to the port profile, it will change the port. So there is a command called inherit port profile. We're gonna be doing all this live. So uh, if you, you know, this is uh, for your reference, so you can come back and take a look at it later again. Uh, but we also just wanna talk about it before we go out and do these things. So there's two different types of port profiles. And first of all, we have hardware ports, ETH, and then we have virtual ports, VETH. So the ETH port profile, these are basically tied to hardware network interface cards, and these are our uplinks. Now, in the case of Nexus, I'm sorry, in the case of UCS Manager and Blade servers, then we actually, these hardware NICs, we know are another level of virtualization. They are VNICs, okay? But for all intents and purposes, ETH is a hardware uplink, okay? So think of it as a physical card, whether it's a VNIC or an actual NIC, it's an uplink. VETH, on the other hand, these are tied to the southbound virtual machines. Now, there's also something called VLAN. Well, of course there are VLANs in our ETH and VETH profiles, but there's also something called system VLANs. Now, VLANs, not system VLANs, but just VLANs are traditional VLANs, okay? 802.1Q tagging, uh, you know, whatever the VLAN number is, we create it in the virtual switch. It sends up, you know, it sends up through a trunk. We can have access, uh, Ports typically are VETH, our access mode or switch port mode access with a particular VLAN. So whatever traffic comes in uh, with untagged, you know, no dot one Q header, we put it in that system. Uh, I'm sorry, we put it in that switch port access VLAN. And then our uplink Ethernets are trunk ports, just the same as a standard switch. So what's this idea of a system VLAN? Well, the idea is that it's used to give immediate cut through access to the VM kernel. So since this is a virtual switch, it's not a hardware switch, the actual software or really the operating system of, and we're just going to use ESXi and VMware uh, since it was the first and uh, most, you know, most heavily used, like I said, about 95% of the installations of hypervisors out there are using that. So that's what we'll talk to mostly. But let's just say ESXi is booting. 
Well, the VM kernel, the management VM kernel, needs to be able to talk to vCenter. Well, what if it's writing over top of a new distributed virtual switch that doesn't really come online until it talks to vCenter and it talks to the virtual supervisor module? So we've kind of got this chicken and egg situation where which one comes first? So the idea of a system VLAN basically allows cut through access. It basically says, hey, VM kernel, you can go ahead and on this VLAN only, or VLANs if we configure multiple, you can go ahead and talk uh, through basically like your own local switch, pseudo local switch, to the network on these VLANs. And then when the virtual Ethernet module comes up and online registered in the distributed virtual switch, then you'll go ahead and talk through that Ethernet blade, the virtual Ethernet module blade. Okay, so we don't have to run. In fact, we'll show an example of this in a diagram in just a moment. We don't have to run our ESXi kernels through the distributed virtual switch. They can continue to run on their own local switch, you know, vSwitch zero or whatever. Uh, but it's a good practice and there's a lot of benefits to running your ESXi on the actual VEM itself on the Nexus 1000V. Okay, there are two different modes to the Nexus 1000V. There's layer two mode and there's also layer three mode. In layer two mode, the VEMs have to be on the same VLAN as the virtual supervisor module control VLAN. Now, that was an older model, and for the last few years now, Cisco has recommended layer three. So basically, as the VEMs come online and they talk their, um, their standard APIC protocol, which is the standard protocol that uh, any you know, Nexus uh, 7000 switch or even the CAT 6500 switch, the blades talk to the supervisor module using that protocol, uh, all that traffic is encapsulated into UDP 4785 using the command capability L3 control on the VETH profile for the ESXi VM kernel. And that has to be there before we migrate that kernel interface over from the standard virtual switch, vSwitch zero, over to the distributed virtual switch of the N1KV. So that traffic is encapsulated and it's sent up to the virtual supervisor module across VLAN. So my ESXi modules do not have to be on the same VLANs as my uh, VSMs. Now, even if they are on the same VLANs, it's still a good idea to use layer three mode just because all of a sudden layer three tools become available to us for utilization and troubleshooting. Things like really simple things like ping and traceroute, okay? It's also important that system VLANs are used for both the VETH and the ETH port profiles for this layer three uh, control. We're gonna take a look in a little bit at the actual uh, configuration after we do the installation of the ne Nexus 1000V. We'll take a look at creating port channels. Now, uh, there are the, there is the ability to do uh, what I mentioned, which is a VPC host mode, virtual port channel host mode, uh, based on Mac pinning. And if we're not in a blade server, we can also do based on LACP or based on uh, CDP. And there's also something called uh, LACP offload, where the negotiation of LACP is offloaded from the virtual supervisor module to the virtual ethernet module. And this is important if we're doing LACP, and remember the Nexus 1000V does not have to be running on the UCS uh, blade series, okay? It could be on a UCS C series chassis. It could also be on absolutely any other vendor's hardware server platform as long as we're running a, a supported hypervisor. So like for instance, ESXi4, ESX4, and ESXi5 are all supported with the Nexus 1000V. So that could be running on anyone's server hardware. If it's running on an actual physical server, and let's say I have four NICs, four hardware Ethernet NICs, at least NIC ports, whether they're on one PCIe card or two PCIe cards, really makes no difference. 
in the physical pizza box server, the rack mount server, then I can have those all LACP aggregated up to the northbound switch. Okay, you cannot use LACP with UCS blade series, but you can use Mac pinning. But if I do want to do LACP from, let's say, a pizza box uh, rack mount server, and I want that to go northbound to the switch, then uh, what happens if my virtual supervisor module, really what happens if both of them go offline? Well, because this is truly a distributed virtual switch, just like a distributed physical switch, um, actually this is kind of unlike a physical virtual uh, physical switch. If a physical switch loses both supervisor modules, traffic stops. But in a Nexus 1000V, even if both VSMs go offline or are not reachable, traffic still continues to pass just fine. The problem might become what if LACP needs to get renegotiated, maybe an upstream switch gets rebooted, something like that. Um, well, there is something called LACP offload, and that allows the LACP not to be negotiated by the virtual supervisor modules, but instead to be negotiated by the virtual Ethernet module or the ESXi host DVS itself. So taking a look at some show commands, um, kind of a little bit of a convoluted command, makes sense if you actually uh, you know, think about what it's doing, uh, but basically module vem3 execute. So if I wanted to SSH into any one of my ESXi hosts and run commands directly on that shell itself, I could do that. And the command would be vem command show port or directly on the ESXi host vem command show pinning. So if I'm on the virtual supervisor module, Let's say I've SSH'd into the Nexus 1000V, not to the ESXi host itself, but directly to the N1KV. Then I can say, hey, go out to module, virtual Ethernet module 3 through 66, because I can have 64 blades plus my two supervisors. So go out to blade 3, go out to blade 5, go out to blade 20, and execute this command there on that host. And that command is the command that you could run there on the host natively, which is vem command show pinning or show port. So I put those in there for reference. We'll be taking a look at those commands, specifically with VPC host mode. So now let's break from Nexus 1000V for a moment, and let's talk about VMFX, and then we'll talk about adapter effects, and then we will move on and actually do the installation and then all the configuration and testing of the Nexus 1000V, including ACLs and QoS and things like that. And then we'll move on and we'll talk about, or we'll actually do the demonstration separately of VMFX and then finally AdapterFX. So VMFX creates the same type of distributed virtual switch in VMware as the Nexus 1000V does. And it's now supported on KVM and Hyper-V as of UCS 2.1. So this is made up of, well, it's still got the same virtual Ethernet module installed in the ESXi host for the data plane, but now the UCS, really the fabric interconnects, act as sort of a VSM or a virtual supervisor module. Okay, so there is no standalone virtual supervisor module. Instead, the fabric interconnect is your control and management plane. Okay, so everything is configured and controlled from the UCM, uh, sorry, from the UCS manager GUI, and that's specifically where we look at the VM tab. So when we were doing walkthroughs earlier, you, and you know we kind of avoided it, but there's a VM tab in UCS manager that's not for Nexus 1000V at all. It is for VMFX, which is an alternate DVS. So then let's talk about adapter FEX. This is yet another FEX solution from Cisco. So this time it's used to extend a Nexus 5000 down to a pizza box or C-series rack mount server. More specifically, to extend the fabric down to a P81E Palo card, or the next generation of that card is the VIC-1225 PCIe Express, uh, and I said CAN, that should be CNA. Uh, let me just fix that real quick. Mistype there. 
Converge Network Adapter. So this creates VEth and VFC ports in the Nexus 5K, and we will be doing this as well. So if there are, let's say, on just a C-series server, on a VIC-1225, or actually what we have is the P81E in our uh, particular C-series, uh, because that's what's on the exam, you have two 10 gigabit Ethernet SFP physical ports on the PCIe card, and each of those actually have two logical channels. So there's four logical channels, two physical ports, four logical channels. So this breaks out to port one, channel one, is going to be used for Ethernet with optional hardware failover to physical port two. Then it will still be physical port one, but logical channel two. This is going to create HBA zero or our first HBA for fabric A for SAN. There, of course, there's no failover. Standard multipathing software would be used. Then physical port two, but logical channel three will be used for Ethernet with hardware failover supported to physical port one. And then physical port two, logical channel four will create HBA one for our standard uh, SAN Fabric B connectivity. Now, an alternative to adapter fex is to use UCS Manager to actually manage your C series server. So, this is not in conjunction with anything, there is no adapter fex here. Uh, well, it, it, it essentially is kind of using, it, well, it's, it's, it's not under the marketing term, let's just say that of adapter fex. Uh, but instead, what happens is our C-series servers connect up to a pair of Nexus 2000s, specifically the 2232 double Ps, and those act as the I.O. modules in a sort of a virtual or pseudo blade chassis. Okay, so, and, and, and we'll show a diagram of this as well. But basically, uh, the you know, let's say we have one pair of Nexus 2232s. Uh, so Nexus 2232A would go up to Fabric Interconnect A, and Nexus 2232B would go up to Fabric Interconnect B, and port one of my uh, VIC-1225 or P81E card in my C-series server, let's say C200 server, would go up to uh, Nexus 2232A, and port two would go up to Nexus 2232B. Okay, so this would look similar, at least to the uh, UCS manager and to the fabric interconnects, it looks similar to a blade chassis. Each pair of 2232s look like I.O. modules. Now they show up in a slightly different place in the, um, in the equipment tab. They show up under rack mount servers instead of blade chassis servers, uh, but they, function very similar. We can create service profiles. We can allocate those to our rack mount servers. So it gives us a lot of nice flexibility there while still having, for whatever reason, maybe preferred uh, rack mount servers, preferred to blade servers. Now, the, de the version of software that you're running depends on how many wires you need or how many cables. This required four cables in UCS 2.0. So we had to have two one gigabit ethernet cables connected from the C-series server LAN on motherboard ports to the 2232 fexes to provide out of band control and management plane. And then we had to have two 10 gigi cables connected from the C-series server SFP ports to the 2232 fex to provide the data plane. Now in UCS 2.1, a feature called single wire management came about, and this allowed a single pair of 10 gigi cables from the C-Series SFP to the 2232 faxes to provide both the data and management control planes. So we no longer needed the one gigabit ethernet LAN on motherboard ports connected at all. Now, we don't have this configured in our lab, and here's the reason why. If, and, and again, the course is centered around the CCIE data center exam, um, this is perfectly fine to use, but then it makes your C-series servers look just like a blade server, right? Like a blade chassis. So if we've already gone through, or if the lab has already had us go through and configure 
uh, a blade chassis, why would it have us configure rack mount servers in the same fashion as blade servers were? Um, assuming that they don't change the version from 2.0 to 2.1 anytime soon, 2.1 is what gave us uh, FCOE northbound of the FIs, but 2.0 is still requiring, uh, well, there is no northbound FCOE support. So that means that if they were using the C200 server connected to the blade, or sorry, to the uh, fabric interconnects, then there would be no way for them to test you on uh, fiber channel over ethernet or FCOE. So if they're instead using actual adapter effects, as we've listed here with the 5Ks, that's where we can break everything out as uh, VETH and VHBAs on a Nexus 5K and specifically create VETH and VFCs and do all the binding that we would normally do for uh, a converged network adapter and fiber channel over Ethernet on our Nexus 5Ks. So I think this is what they're much more likely to use, those C200s uh, specifically that are listed in the hardware blueprint for, uh, but that's just my take on it. So that's what we'll be doing. So let's go ahead and switch over and we'll then take, we'll, we'll begin by doing the installation of the Nexus 1000V, configuration, all of the testing of it. Then we'll go on to VMFX. And then after we've done VMFX, then we will go ahead and configure AdapterFX. So before we move on to the actual configuration and installation of the Nexus 1000V, I wanted to bring up a diagram and kind of help, uh, hope to help explain how this uh, really works. So we have what uh, appears as a virtual chassis switch, and what happens is we have our virtual supervisor module, our primary, and our secondary, which are going to be modules one and two. And these are going to be running on a pair of hardware devices, such as the Nexus uh, 1110S or 1110X. Uh, the old part number was the Nexus uh, 1010. Uh, so these are basically just appliances that are running a hypervisor that are running these virtual machines. Okay, but you do want to have separate uh, physical devices to run each of the VSMs for redundancy so that if one physical device dies, you don't lose both of your primary and secondary soup modules in one fell swoop. Now, of course, that's kind of a waste to just run one uh, virtual machine on a you know powerful hardware appliance like that. So that's why they have the different dash S and different dash X models. Uh, they allow you to run I think the S is like six uh, VMs and the X I think is 10 VMs, uh, might be even more than that. Check the product guide on cisco.com. But essentially you can run, let's say a VSM primary on one physical device. You could also run a VSG primary, uh, ASA 1000 um, V, uh, you could run a VWAS. So you can run a number of different devices on, or a number of different virtual machines. You also could run your VSM primary for your N1KV switch number one, and maybe you have switch number two, switch number three, uh, because each of these can handle up to 66, really 64 VEM modules for a total of 66 modules because module one and two are your VSMs. So maybe you've got uh, you know, 300 ESXi hosts. So you're obviously going to need more than one Nexus 1K virtual switch. So I could run VSM P1, uh, P2, you know, for uh, Nexus, or sorry, uh, VSM, you know, primary one, primary two, secondary one, secondary two, primary three, and secondary three on these hardware platforms. And then the VEM modules. So the VEM modules install 
uh, I've drawn this out is your Ethernet. I'm sorry, this is your uh, server, your hardware, whether it's a blade or whether it's a pizza box server, um, you've got that hardware. Running on top of that is the hypervisor and then your VEM module. Okay, so your VEM module in this particular instance is serving not only uh, these individual VMs, but it's also serving uh, for management, for vMotion, and for fault tolerance. Now what we see is that, and again, in the diagram that you'll be able to download from class files and blow up a little bit more, you'll see that these colored uh, instances are going to Fabric Interconnect A and Fabric Interconnect B. The green is A and the blue is B. And those are Ethernets. So Ethernet 3 slash 1, 3, because it's in module 3. It was the first ESXi VEM module to be brought online to the N1KV switch. Uh, so 3 slash 1, 3 slash 2, E33, 3, 3, 3, 4, and 5, and 3, 6, and 7. And then handed down to the actual VM kernel for management is VE1 and 2, VE3, and VE4 and 5, and then a bunch of VEs, one or multiple, however many you need to consume, per virtual machine. So these VEs are all going to go up through these two active active based on VPC host mode Mac pinning something we're going to take a look at here in just a moment and I suppose this should really be capital Okay, so going up through Fabric Interconnect A and B, active active, so maybe it's splitting this one, this one off to A, this one off to A, and this one off to A, and then it's splitting maybe this one off to B and this one off to B, and that's how it's doing its Mac pinning up uh, northbound to the Fabric Interconnects and then the northbound switches beyond there. And then these two Ethernet interfaces are being used for these two VEth interfaces interfaces for active active fault tolerance uh, maybe vmotion has active to a with failover to b okay that's not how we're going to set it up now uh, we're going to set it up as we have active and passive okay and uh, the esxi host is managing the active passive but this is just giving an uh, a alternate view or an example, other things we've talked about as possible best practices. And so you also do see here that each of these ESXi hosts have a VEM module and it's running all of the functions, not only all the VMs, but also all of the kernel functions as well. It certainly does not have to be that way. And so for an alternate view of not only alternate switches, but also Just get this out of the way here. But also of, of having our VSMs run on VEMs. So here's my virtual supervisor primary module one and my virtual supervisor secondary module two. And these VSMs are running on their own VEMs. That's perfectly supported. In fact, it's recommended. Unless you're running, you know, a good idea is the 1110s. One, because Cisco gets to make more money on more hardware. Uh, <laughs> no, but seriously, um, just to have separate management, uh, you know, so your server guys aren't ma managing your, your supervisor modules. That kind of gets a little sticky sometimes. So not a bad idea to have those running on separate hardware platforms. But it's perfectly supported to have these running on their own VEMs. No problem. It's also perfectly acceptable to have uh, vSwitch, the individual standard vSwitch, let's say for ESXi uh, running for management and another one for vMotion, another one for fault tolerance, another one for DRS, whatever. Uh, and then your VEM only running your VMs, as well as it's perfectly acceptable for it to run your kernel functions as well. So here's an alternate view. Now, one of the things 
that is commonly misunderstood and I, I see misconfigured from time to time, so I want to point out, is the thought that here's another view of the N1KV switch. So this, this dotted line is the switch. Here are my physical Ethernet uplinks, whether they're actually VNIX in a Nexus, uh, sorry, in a UCS B series chassis, or whether they're actual real NICs in a physical server, really makes no difference. But these are my Ethernet ports, and then these are my VETH ports that are handed down to and consumed by my VMs. And of course, I create Ethernet port profiles to be inherited by my Ethernet ports, and I create VETH port profiles to be inherited by my VETH ports. Now, one of the misconceptions is that as long as I have in my view, so if I do a show run and I see that I have Ethernet ports, then any VETH ports can use those. And that's not exactly true. And here's really specifically where that's not exactly true. First of all, if I have a VETH port being consumed by a VM, and it's possible that I have assigned a VM two ports. You know, I might assign it two NICs, so it might have two NICs. Maybe this one only has one NIC. This one has one NIC. Um, this VETH port, let's just say it's VETH, you know, 200, it will never change. If I move it from one ESXi host to another, in fact, let me just bring up uh, this example again. If I move this VM, if I vMotion it over here to this ESXi host, it keeps its VETH port. So if that was VETH 18, it keeps VETH 18. Now my physical uplinks, those are bound to the VEM module. Of course, those are bound to the physical ESXi host. But my VETH ports, they travel with me. And that's what gives me the ability to I uh, keep my same ACLs, my same QoS, my same uh, you know, rate limiting or prioritization, uh, same security, all of that. So back to this, the idea that as long as, and these are typically switch port mode access. So if this is access, you know, switch port mode access VLAN 110, then as long as one of these has VLAN 110 as part of its upbound trunk, dot one q trunk, then it should be able to switch that traffic, right? Well, sort of. And here's the sort of. The sort of, let me just erase all this so that it's clear. Okay, so this is what we started with. Now I'm gonna overlay this on it. And you're gonna see that really behind the scenes, those Ethernet ports were actually on one ESXi host, and there were there's another ESXi host here that's representing part of the switch, but I don't have any ports assigned yet. So I need to draw those or I need to create those. Really what I need to do is log into the ESXi host, go to the go to the networking. Well, first of all, go to configuration tab, then to networking, then click on distributed virtual switch and say manage physical adapters and then assign physical adapters to this ESXi host, to the distributed virtual switch. Because otherwise, the VETH ports that are currently being uh, run because the VMs are currently being run on this ESXi host, they can get out. But I can't have VMs that are running on another host. Okay, I can't, whoops, should have created another layer. I can't have those VMs and their ports miraculously, wirelessly jump across. Uh, I haven't actually seen ESXi 5 version wireless yet. <laughs> so they can't wirelessly hop across and get up to another physical port outbound. And even if this were on the same UCS chassis, there's still no physical traces connecting these two physically separate blades. So I do need to make sure that I actually have physical uplinks for those VMs and their corresponding VETHs to traverse northbound. And then finally, 
Uh, we're not going to really look or talk too much about this, but I did create um, or helped create a uh, a drawing here that kind of puts everything together, kind of brings everything together from, you know, this being the last class in our section where we, or, or sorry, the last class in our series where we started out talking about the Nexus switching line. We began talking about OTV, uh, Fabric Path, talking about VPC, and then we did our storage class with our MDSs and our JBODs, and then now we're on the, the UCS portion with our Fabric Interconnects, our Blade server, uh, QoS that's assigned to those individual, uh, our, our Palo Vic card, uh, Mezzanine adapter card, VNIX that have been created, QoS that's been created and assigned, and then now rounding it out with the Nexus 1000V and ESXi VMware, um, brought it all together. So this will be kind of a complete picture, probably hard to see from this uh, scaled out perspective, but if you, you know, if you zoom in, um, you'll be able to see everything a little bit better. And I'll certainly include that as part of the class files. Okay, shows me, uh, you know, shows my fiber channel no drop on, whoops on my VHBAs, how those VHBAs create VETH and VFC ports, as long as they're part of a Palo card. If they're not, we already took a look how they still create VFCs, but how those are bound to the actual FEX port itself. Okay, um, how my VNIX in ESXi ultimately create VMNICs, how those VMNICs correspond to physical ETH interfaces, or at least pseudo physical ETH interfaces in my Nexus 1000V. And then how those are passed on down to uh, port profiles for uplinks, port profiles for system uplinks, uh, and how those get passed down to VETHs and VNIX down to, or actually really VMNIX down to the virtual machine itself. So I'll include that with the class files uh, for your reference.